My name is Dean Krimmel, and I'm a Baltimore historian. I had a long interest in, in public markets and Baltimore neighborhoods, traditions, and, and the way we live here. There are people living in Baltimore, uh, white uh, European settlers living in Baltimore from the 1720s on. And by the 1760s, there's enough people in, in this town that there's a need of clamoring for a market. So it's a public market authorized. Uh, and it's at Baltimore Street and Gay Street, right in the center of, we call it downtown now, right near the harbor, uh, within a block, several blocks of the harbor. Um, over the next decades, Baltimore is a boom town. And by the 1780s, there are about five to seven, 8,000 people living here, uh, spread from what we could, would call downtown the Inner Harbor to the west side, to Federal Hill, to Fells Point. People want to be closer to a market. Um, the state legislature, the, the assembly, approved three new markets uh, in 1784. And the first to be built was at, at Fells Point, Broadway. Uh, that's where we are now. Uh, that's 1786. And within two years, there's two other markets. At uh, the Center Market, by where Port Discovery is today, and Hanover Market, which is on the west side of the Inner Harbor. The, um, as, as Baltimore grows, the number of markets grow. And in the early 1800s, uh, there's a market open in Lexington Street, uh, which is now Lexington Market, you know, one of the older ones as well. And, uh, and uh, about two decades later, uh, people in Old Town want a market, and uh, one opens at uh, Bel Air, Bel Air Road. So it's the Bel Air Market, because it's on the road to Bel Air. Um, Baltimore continues growing in the years before the Civil War and becomes, it's one of the major, major cities, it's one of the biggest cities in America. Uh, and in the years before the Civil War, there's another three or four markets built. Uh, one at, on Holland Street, Holland's Market, one in South Baltimore, Cross Street Market, uh, in Canton, the Canton Market. Then the, the, the last chapter in the, uh, the Baltimore's public market system is in the years after the Civil War, um, when a, uh, a market is built on Lafayette, at Lafayette Avenue and uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, Lafayette Market. Uh, which is in existence today, and then Northeast Market on, uh, on Monument Street, which, is, which survives today and is a thriving uh, market in the Johns Hopkins area. And um, that is, uh, by the 1880s, there's a dozen markets serving several hundred thousand people. So that is the, uh, the function of the markets are to serve neighborhoods. Uh, they are to feed, feed the population. Uh, once, a, once a market opens, it transformed the, uh, the blocks in the neighborhood around it. Uh, Broadway, you could see when you're here, you can see that it's a, a marketplace full of, full of shops and businesses. It's, it's a commercial hub. And that was true of all the markets. The property values went up right away. The, uh, the, the flow of, of, of patrons, uh, initially a couple days a week, when markets were open, they weren't open every day a week, but three days a week, two days a week, marketplaces were full of people. They were full of teamsters with wagons. They had stables nearby. They had rooming houses nearby. The restaurants and the uh, clothing shops and everybody wanted to be near a market. Uh, so the major, kind of the major influence of the markets was to create commercial hubs. Fells Point is hustling and bustling through the 1800s, growing in population, you know, thriving. The market itself doesn't get a lot of attention in the newspaper other than say petty crimes or or some events um, there's um, there are reports when, when somebody falls asleep in the market or tries to use it as a lodging it's against the law that gets reported um, there was a, there's a pickpocket maybe that you know, that shows up in the market and that gets reported when somebody gets arrested um, the um, in 1880 uh, in the Sun it reports that there were the two men Robert Kelly and Thomas O'Hare uh, get arrested on Alisana Street with their quote unquote their, their, their arms full of cabbages, supposedly stolen from the market. Uh, they protest and say they're well connected Democrats. They're, uh, they're, they're, they shouldn't be arrested, but they, they get arrested nonetheless. Um, so the market the market shows up in, in these you know we call them human interest stories, but they're just they're every it's everyday life. So they're not very remarkable places, except for maybe major events. There are parades. Uh, there are parades along Broadway because Broadway is such an important place. In uh, 1869, when the, the immigrant depot, which is across the way at, at Locust Point, and this, this neighborhood is tied to Locust Point with, by a ferry uh, that comes across and, and docks in, at the foot of Broadway, the pier. Um, when the immigrant pier opens up 
in 1869, there's a major procession, and that procession uh, is along, goes along Baltimore Street with uh, with militia marching and bands and so forth. And there's uh, there's uh, you know, Broadway Market has a hall by then. Uh, it has a second-story hall that served as an armory for the National Guard, and it's a place where there's there's lectures and there's there's meetings, labor meetings. So that becomes a, a focal point for these a place where parades begin. Um, other than that, there's you know the markets themselves are pretty prosaic. They're just they're just places that don't get in the news a lot. There is a there is a there is a great uh, a great source for insight into life at the markets. In the 1960s, the Baltimore Sun, Sun Magazine ran these columns called I Remember, and they were interviews with local people. And um, they, they read like oral history transcripts. Uh, later I found out they were mostly edited by Hal Williams, the editor, but, um, but they, he, they're written in a very conversational tone. Uh, there was a man named Andrew Ford who worked here from 1917 through the 1960s. And he was interviewed in, in, the, in, the, in 69, right after a fire had destroyed the North Shed, much of the North Shed. And he was a meat cutter. He tells these stories of, of which I've read in other meat cutters telling the same thing and, and fish vendors as well. Stories of the market in the, uh, the pre, uh, the market when it was open on the side, when canvas, the, the, um, there were no walls. Canvas uh, just would lay, you know, canvas was, was dropped down to the, to this, to, um, there was, there was canvas on the sides of the market uh, instead of doorways and, and windows. It was, uh, it was so cold, meat cutters sometimes walk, went into the walk-in fridges to cut meat, uh, the fridges and freezers that they had in there. Uh, everybody had a charcoal container and they put coal in it and, and had their own fires. Uh, the, the conditions, uh, day started at 4 a.m. when uh, from the, probably before the 60s, when there were, there were hospitals, schools, restaurants, bars, everybody, he happened to be meat cutter. So everybody wanted meat, they wanted delis. Bars had uh, you know, free food, uh, free food probably up until the end of the 30s or 40s. So um, for a lot of the market history, these places supplied, they supplied everybody. They became these, these hubs in the food distribution network. So um, Andrew Ford tells these stories of, of you know, back in the day, uh, when standing at market was what it was called. You, you stood for four to five a.m. through midday, and on Saturdays you worked all day and all night. The uh, markets are, are really a very traditional form. If, if you if you look if you're interested in markets and you you go online and you you'll end up you'll end up with um, I guess you'll end up in in Europe and in other countries, of course, where where public markets are still a thing. And uh, what you end up seeing is these. For the most part, open sheds, sometimes brick buildings and square buildings, uh, but many times just a simple long shed with a an aisle. And we've probably a lot of us have been to these places in, uh, overseas and, and in other cities. One big central aisle where the uh, the stalls are on either side, and then the bigger markets have side aisles. Uh, and traditionally, uh, in Baltimore and in most cities, there'd also be eve uh, eve aisles, and the eaves would be the uh, stalls that were on the street and they literally had canvas awnings over them on market day so they'd be set up uh, on the edge of the market facing you know out into the street on the other side on our when you when you walk around a marketplace on the other side of the street opposite these e stalls there'd be another set of stalls from people who set up stall boards and um, uh, and their own portable movable they're called movable stalls so if you in neighborhoods in Fells Point, you can walk around and look at the curb stones, and you'll see numbers. Every once in a while, with a granite block, and that's a number from a, stall, a street stall. Because these markets weren't just buildings, and they did have a big hierarchy. The center aisle was like the prime real estate. The the meat cutters, or the butchers, on the center aisle. The uh, produce people in the center, often on the center and side aisles. The uh, the people who had uh, the smaller well, the, the movable stalls on the streets were kind of small, and they must be about 10 feet wide and, and about eight, 10 feet deep and 8 feet wide, so pretty small places. They were movable, and they came in and out on market days. Um, the, uh, in Broadway, there was uh, the original Broadway shed, and they were called sheds or shambles, which is a British word, shambles. Um, in the 1780s, when it opened, it was down on the um, Broadway Square, kind of in between where Jimmy's and Max's is. So it was a tucked into the corner of the, uh, of the, of the foot of Broadway, the square down there. Uh, that was from 1780s to the 18, 1790s. Uh, and then uh, it was relocated to the center of Market, or Market Street it was called, Broadway. 
uh, after that. And over the next couple decades, over about a 50 year period, three different sheds or three new sheds were built. So at one point before the Civil War in this neighborhood, there was there was market, there were market sheds from Fleet Street all the way to Thames. Long, wooden, low sheds, one story. And then after the Civil War, the, the market shed at, at Fleet at the northern end was rebuilt to a two-story market hall. If you go to Holland's Market in West Baltimore, what you see is, is a, what Broadway Market would have looked like from the 1864. Uh, to 1964 and, and late 69 was when there was a fire. Uh, it's a two-story hall with a long shed behind it, one one-story shed, uh, and that's it. Was simple. There are usually markets are always located on inclines, so at the end of the day you can bring the hoses in and hose them down and, and wash out the debris. Market markets markets tend to reflect markets reflect the time period, kind of the culture and time. Um, they also lag a little bit. They also they're they're very traditional things. They're they're um, you know they're places where uh, family businesses and in many cases in Baltimore it was it was immigrant uh, families uh, set up a business, pass it on or sell it, and the, the name stays the same. The 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 the, uh, the food that they sell stays the same. Um, and when time changes, when when there's a uh, kind of demand for new services, the markets they respond, but often slowly. In, in Fells Point at Broadway, as the, the neighborhood became kind of known as Sailor Town in the 1930s and 40s, and it was still an, an older, uh, as, as the, as the uh, Polish immigrants kind of start to age and their children come of age in the 40s and 50s, the market, the market is seen as being in decline. But every market is seen in Baltimore and probably around the country are seen as being in decline because there's a thing called supermarkets. And supermarkets are now, by the 40s, they're a generation old. So people are, people in places that, uh, that have supermarkets are not going to public markets anymore. Broadway, Broadway, Broadway held on and, and I think Broadway thrived through the 60s, uh, even though uh, the old timers would tell you there was more and more parking problems, and as the old, as the early generations, as people aged and moved further out, they did have uh, trouble, and they started to get frustrated with parking, and there was a little more congestion, and uh, there was there was um, yeah, the market me merchants say they did start to suffer, but I think Fell's point, I think it was until the road fight uh, in the 60s and 70s that the market probably started to feel it. In a, in a very painful way. I think up to the up to the 60s, I think the market was doing fine. So in in the late 60s, and well, the middle 60s on, as the as Baltimore officials, transportation officials, look at ways to move move you know move people around, uh, travelers and suburbanites and, and Baltimoreans, uh, there's a you know there there are plans to put a, a highway across the west east west highway. Uh, and at one point, it was uh, the idea was Fleet Street, and maybe it was elevated, or maybe it was a four lane highway. The road fight uh, in Fells Point was a battle of about a decade long uh, against a highway through the neighborhood that was going to go east and west through Baltimore. And the victory in the late 70s freed up people to start uh, investing in property here and uh, kind of rediscovering it. At that point, the market was really in a, in a, in a probably in a, in a really bad way. It had suffered in the 70s. Uh, there was a fire in 69. Um, the North Shed, part of the North Shed was, was demolished and a parking lot was created. And then in the late 70s, the South Shed that we're in front of was, uh, was renovated and a lot of money was put into it. But it was a, uh, a market that struggled because the neighborhood had, had changed. Old timers were gone um, and it had lost its, it lost its customers. In, in, in September of 69, there was a, a fire destroyed. Uh, it, it damaged the, the market hall. Uh, on the, at the North Shed, or the North Market, um, and it destroyed the, uh, the one-story shed that was behind it. So the decision when it was rebuilt in 71, is this is a, a, a city, there, this is a public market system, it's city money. Um, the, 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 this, there was the decision made to take the, the second-story building, the shed, down. It, it didn't have its function, it, it didn't need to be there anymore, the thinking was. And then the shed itself was so badly damaged that the decision was to make a parking lot out of it. Because in the 70s, markets were an anachronism. These are these 18th and 19th century animals that are just exotic in an era of refrigeration and supermarkets. And the one thing that uh, everybody said they wanted, which we still say we want, is parking. So the, the, so the, the, 
the market was not rebuilt. The decision was to make it smaller, which is in keeping. Uh, and the same thing happened at the, um, the South Shed. The, um, once renovation happens, if there's old, dilapidated, 100-year-old buildings, the decisions all, in, at Broadway and all the other markets is generally to make them smaller. I started doing market tours here in the 80s, and uh, the market manager always said, this is like the Civil War. This is the North versus the South. Just for your info, Broadway market never seemed to get along. The Merchant Association was bad. They didn't like each other. <laughs> I don't know why, though. I don't, they don't know why. Um, market trends. Market trends. By the, uh, by the 1970s, as you know, so-called you know, young white professionals are moving back to the city, there's a gentrification movement. People are, are convinced that the markets are, you know, markets are, are romantic, markets are old school. They're, they're, um, they're gonna attract people. If only they had the right mixture of, of goods. Um, and you start seeing the trends around the country and the trends in Baltimore are, uh, are new vendors selling gourmet cheeses and coffees. Uh, alongside older meat vendors and produce vendors, and they're um, they're trying to make a mix of it, and uh, or they're trying to make a go of it with these new mixtures, and it's a constant battle. Uh, and the trends in markets, I think it continues to be about the same thing for everybody managing a market, and the same is true of a, fr of, a, of, a of a of a farmers market, and the farmers market movement grew in the same period. There's the same. It's the same question: what mixture of goods? How do you balance? Prepared foods with cooked, prepared and cooked foods with, with meats. How do you how do you balance how do you how do you how do you um, how do you how do you balance the, uh, the 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 you know the menu of, of items from prepared and cooked foods to to meats to produce to fish and things like that. And the trends the trends in market markets around in Baltimore and I guess some around the country because there's just not a lot of markets around the country. But the trends seem to be to try to support the, 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 the uh, produce and, and meats, the, you know, the basic foods, at the same time introduce and, and nurture new uh, prepared foods, cooked foods. Um, Northeast Market was a trendsetter. They just went almost a lot of, a lot of lunch places because it serves its neighborhood, uh, Hopkins and, and, and neighborhood and uh, the businesses around it. Um, so the, the markets like the, in Broadway, it was, it's the same thing. How do we, how do we mix? Who are the people moving in here? Uh, these new neighbors, are they interested in what we have? Do we need, the other trend is to, to take, um, to use the market spaces in new ways. In Washington DC, Eastern Market is well known for, um, not, not really for its, for its vendors inside, but for what happens outside. At Eastern Market every weekend, there's, uh, there's crafts fairs, there's art, there's some kind of community event. Um, so that's a big trend in markets. Um, Reading Terminal in Philadelphia is a major downtown market, and it has both a, a heavy prepared for food for locals and for visitors, and it also has a, a lot of a local Mennonites come in, and it has a strong, strong kind of traditional market fair. Uh, so it's a combination of people doing their shopping and other people just being tourists or visitors in their own town. Uh, with the other, and there's another trend: um, Cross Street Market with a bar at the end, uh, where the fish market was. You know, people want to be out in these places, but they also want to. You know, on a Saturday, it's a happy hour crowd. Uh, even Friday, Saturday, and probably Sunday as well. Um, so the the trends are: they have trends in markets. Have always been. How do we somehow adjust and adapt to the times, but how do we keep those traditions? How do we still, maybe stubbornly, still offer the kinds of foods that our grandparents and great-grandparents will look for? I think the people who manage markets do try to learn from one another, and they also keep their eyes open on, obviously, you know, I think on, on retail trends and on just on general, just general the culture and what people are looking for and want to do. Um, as long as I've been looking at markets, like 30 some years doing tours and studying them, um, there's no silver bullet though. It's just, it's a difficult kind of, um, this old institution uh, in a, uh, you know, in a new, in a new, in a new, uh, new clothing. The people managing markets and creating markets today, uh, they learn some new things from the Eastern markets of the world that have created a, you know, community hub and said, hey, this works for where we are. Um, I'll bet they learn a lot, people learn a lot from the Reading Terminals uh, in terms of how to mix 
mixed merchants um, and how to create the space and use the space. But that's a that's a big market. But there's still I think there's still lessons to learn from all of the all of the all of the markets. And it is that combination of uh, you know tradition and, and innovation. It so much depends on your immediate surroundings um, and the the, um, the needs of your market system. Baltimore is the as far as I know, it's still the only only city that has a, a so-called public system. Uh, at least, although it's it's managed, but, uh, Lexington Market is managed differently than the other markets, which is our, our public. But um, kind of that's an aside. Um, but but Baltimore is, is the only city that I know of in, in, in the United States that that has a number of public markets still, uh, and not one major market. Uh, Lexington is a big downtown market, but at other cities. Lexington would be the only market. So we do have these other challenges in place like in Fells Point with the Broadway. What does this need to be in the future? Uh, I suspect, you know, it needs to be, it needs to reflect what, uh, you know, what people want these days. So there's some, um, there's some surrendering to modern trends. But at the same time, it needs to take advantage of its, its, its always its, its heavy draw, which was to, uh, you know, to be, to create a place that people want to go and want to shop, that is convenient, that they can walk to, uh, back and forth. So it always, they always have to serve the locals first. Uh, but those locals have to want to be there. As someone who loves Baltimore and loves uh, Baltimore history, I love, I love connections of the past. But connections of the past don't pay the bills. So um, uh, any, you know, my, my ideas on what, what should happen here should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, I think there's a certain strength. I guess anybody who's, who loves places and who, who, who appreciates um, kind of the power of, of place would tell you that Broadway Market, the real estate it sits on in this sliver in the middle of Broadway, in the middle of heart of this Fells Point, is valuable real estate still. So I think you'd go back to the beginnings, this marketplace should be something that is vibrant, something that brings people together. Is it a place for startups? Is it an incubator? Is it food still? We have a whole DIY culture now. We've got a locavore culture. Do we have too many farmers markets and too many markets? I don't know. Uh, is there room for, is there room for its original, the function was to provide people uh, some basic needs, uh, to bring people together, to its unintended consequence was to create kind of a cultural institution where uh, you learn about other people face to face and uh, life is played out. So I don't know, that it seems like it's a, be a shame to squander on some narrow use, you know, a restaurant or a theater or something like that. But is there some other use that brings people together? The market halls of the 1860s were public spaces, were for lectures. And so there's precedent for, for using the markets as these public spaces. To give to address the you know address uh, current needs, um, you know what are those needs? What uh, is there a way to build the flexibility into it that so it can change? The one thing that hurt the markets over the years was it was they couldn't really change because the merchants bought their stalls and they got passed on. They bought their stalls when the markets were built because the city was trying to defray costs. So they literally had an auction and people would buy a stall for an X amount of dollars and they would pass on. It was kind of like buying a row house in Baltimore. And you'd pass it on and sell it. And um, the city never was able to get much revenue from it because they couldn't raise, they had license fees and they had small rentals, but they never really could recoup much of the cost of running the markets. So that ended up being an inflexible uh, detriment. So if there's a way now to use this public property to, you know, to nurture, to, to create, uh, and to, uh, you know, to help bring people together and around food and other, other, other ventures, I'd be all for it. Uh, but I think if keep the doors open uh, somehow, and then the possibilities will come. I grew up, I don't know if I went to Lex, I went to Lexington Market once or twice as a kid. I grew up in Northwest Baltimore, you know, supermarket supermarket land and you know in my life it was not suburban urban kind of living so um, I walked I started to become really interested in the markets in the 1980s early 80s middle 80s it was just this I guess it was a fascination with this institution that can last 
for 100, 200 years based on all just individual businesses. Um, and obviously I'm sounding way too, like, I don't know, academic. It's probably the food and the neon signs and the business names and this just, this explosion of this place, it seems so vibrant. There seemed to be so much life in these places. And it was the food too. I mean, everybody, yeah, I mean, I raised my kids going to Fadley's and other kind of, you know, eating oysters and, you know, going to, going to sandwich places and, and coming to Fells Point and going to the market. Um, but it's this, I think it, I probably got just as, I got, I'm probably just as much a prey to a romance. I never had to, sh I never shopped there, I never worked there, I never stood there, you know, stood in market. So it's that romance of, wow, this is what people have been doing for generations. You know, rubbing shoulders, buying their goods straight from people, um, getting things that uh, in season, uh, getting things that are connected to, to the people, uh, the place I live. So it's that kind of had that feeling. I was probably drawn to the authenticity of it, the freshness of it, the variety. Um, and just the sheer kind of, you know, it's the sheer joy of just people, you know, doing their thing out in the city. There's this whole immigrant linkage, like Greek, uh, Greek Americans came after, after other uh, European Americans and they got into the, you know, into the, into the cafe and the food business and, uh, you know, prepared food and shops, cafes and, and, and little restaurants. So the, and candy as well. And when I started doing research in markets, the like constants at, at Lexington Market, they were Greek. It was candy, and the Prevost Brothers at Broadway Market were, uh, you know, we had that uh, food stall and, and uh, lunch uh, lunch stall. Um, Germans were the uh, meat cutters and the butchers, and um, the Irish ended up in, in um, selling um, sometimes poultry, a lot of times fish. The Italians went and started to dominate the produce. So when I when I hear the word Prevost Brothers, I think of I think of milkshakes first, uh, hot dogs, uh, and the great signs they had at uh, at the front of their their restaurant. And then I think of just that connection that immigrant groups found a foothold in the markets and, um, yeah, and just seemed to take over certain segments of food. There's a perennial challenge of reinventing old institutions. And what happens a lot of times, I think, um, the people who are thinking about it uh, might be uh, my age, middle age and older. And we, th we think, oh, it's already been done. Everything's been done or we tried that before. And what we forget is that over the past 30 years, the, the wor our world has changed. Um, the number of farmers markets went from one or two to about 30 in Maryland, and maybe more. The you know the, the the whole food business with eating local and raising local it's changed completely. Um, the culture of you know DIY culture and just doing things and expressing yourself and and having experiences that's it's not new, but it's it's pervasive. So when we come to thinking about the future of these places, um, you know, the many of us who are older you know, need to, you know, need to be refre refresh our thinking and think about the world today, because the possibilities are they're different. Um, sometimes they're not that. Sometimes they will end up being exactly what we thought they might be, but we are. Um, but they're. But the possibilities are. Um, there are fresh possibilities for doing something that is might be a classic. So um, building on tradition, which the markets are, building on traditions and doing something innovative would be the, you know, the ideal solution. And there, I have a note on the top of the, the file that says, it's a quote from my, my eldest son. He was five then, 1994, and I wrote down, he said, now that's what I call a market. <laughs> and it was as we went from the north shed into we went into the south shed, oh. and I was taking him on one of my tour preps. <laughs>